Hi, happy Thursday. I'm Mary Logue. I'm the manager at the Claremont Branch Library, and we are continuing on with our reading of The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Today we'll be reading chapters 15 and 16. That means we're a little bit more than halfway through the book. If you recall, yesterday Dorothy was already freed from the Wicked Witch of the West, but she needed to find her friends the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman. So with the help of the Cowardly Lion and the Winkies, they're able to find the two friends and the Winkies restore both the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow back to full health. The four friends, all reunited, decide that it's time to go back to the Emerald City and make the Wizard of Oz give them what he promised that he would if they killed the Wicked Witch of the West. So they start out for the Emerald City. Along the way, they get horribly lost and have no idea how to get there. So Dorothy uses the power of the golden cap and calls the winged monkeys to her. They agree to fly her to the Emerald City, and along the flight there, Dorothy learns the history of the winged monkeys. They get to the Emerald City, and the winged monkeys drop them off outside the gate at the Emerald City. And that's where we pick up in Chapter 15. So Chapter 15. The four travelers walk up to the great gate of the Emerald City and rang the bell. After ringing several times, it was opened by the same guardian of the gate they had met before. What? Are you back again? he asked in surprise. Do you not see us? Asked, answered the scarecrow. But I thought you had gone to visit the Wicked Witch of the West. We did visit her, said the scarecrow. And she let you go again? asked the man in wonder. She could not help it, for she is melted, explained the scarecrow. Melted? Well, that is good news indeed, said the man. Who melted her? It was Dorothy, said the lion gravely. Good gracious, exclaimed the man, and he bowed very low indeed before her. Then he led them into his little room and locked the spectacles from the great box on all their eyes, just as he had done before. Afterward, they passed on through the gate into the Emerald City, and when the people heard from the guardian of the gate that they had melted the Wicked Witch of the West, they all gathered around the travelers and followed them in a great cloud, crowd to the Palace of Oz. The soldier with the green whiskers was still on guard before the door, but he let them in at once, and they were met again by the beautiful green girl who showed each of them to his old room at once so they might rest until the great Oz was ready to receive them. The soldier had the news carried straight to Oz that Dorothy and the other travelers had come back again after destroying the Wicked Witch, but Oz made no reply. They thought the great wizard would send for them at once, but he did not. They had no word from him the next day, nor the next, nor the next. The waiting was tiresome and wearying, at last they grew vexed that Oz should treat them in so poor a fashion, after sending them to undergo hardships and slavery. So the scarecrow at last asked the green girl to take another message to Oz, saying if he did not let them in to see him at once, they would call the winged monkeys to help them and find out whether he kept his promises or not. When the wizard was given this message, he was so frightened that he sent word for them to come to the throne room at four minutes after nine o'clock in the morning. He had once met the winged monkeys in the land of the west, and he did not wish to meet them again. The four travelers passed a sleepless night, each thinking of the gift Oz had promised to bestow upon him. Dorothy fell asleep only once, and then she dreamed she was in Kansas, where Aunt Em was telling her how glad she was to have her little girl home again. Promptly, at nine o'clock the next morning, the green-whiskered soldier came to them, and four minutes later, they all went into the throne room of the Great Oz. Of course, each one of them expected to see the wizard in the shape he had taken before, and all were greatly surprised when they looked about and saw no one at all in the room. They kept close to the door and closer to one another, for the stillness of the empty room was more dreadful than any of the forms they had seen Oz take. Presently, they heard a voice seeming to come from somewhere near the top of the great dome, and it said solemnly, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Why do you seek me? 
They looked again in every part of the room, and then, seeing no one, Dorothy asked, Where are you? I am everywhere, answered the voice, but to the eyes of common mortals I am invisible. I will now seat myself upon the throne, that you may converse with me. Indeed, the voice seemed just then to come straight from the throne itself. So they walked toward it, and stood in a row while Dorothy said, We have come to claim our promise, O Oz. What promise? asked Oz. You promised to send me back to Kansas when the Wicked Witch was destroyed, said the girl. You promised to give me brains, said the Scarecrow. And you promised to give me a heart, said the Tin Woodman. And you promised to give me courage, said the Cowardly Lion. Is the Wicked Witch really destroyed? asked the voice and Dorothy thought it trembled a little. Yes, she answered. I melted her with a bucket of water. Dear me, said the voice, how sudden. Well, come to me tomorrow, for I must have time to think it over. You've had plenty of time already, said the Tin Woodman angrily. We shan't wait a day longer, said the Scarecrow. You must keep your promise to us, exclaimed Dorothy. The lion thought it might be as well to frighten the wizard, so he gave a large, loud roar, and was so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumped away from him in alarm and tipped over the screen that stood in the corner. As it fell with a crash, they looked that way, and the next moment all of them were filled with wonder, for they saw, standing in just the spot the screen had hidden, a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face, who seemed to be as much surprised as they were. The tin woodman, raising his axe, rushed toward the little man and cried out, Who are you? I am Oz, the great and terrible, said the little man in a trembling voice. But don't strike me, please don't, and I'll do anything you want me to. Our friends looked at him in surprise and dismay. I thought Oz was a great head, said Dorothy. I thought Oz was a lovely lady, said the scarecrow. And I thought Oz was a terrible beast, said the tin woodman. "'And I thought Oz was a ball of fire,' exclaimed the lion. "'No, you are all wrong,' said the little man meekly. "'I have been making believe.' "'Making believe!' cried Dorothy. "'Are you not a great wizard?' "'Hush, my dear,' he said. "'Don't speak so loud, or you will be overheard, and I should be ruined. "'I am supposed to be a great wizard.' "'And aren't you?' she asked. "'Not a bit of it, my dear. I'm just a common man.' You're more than that, said the scarecrow in a grieved tone. You're a humbug. Exactly so, declared the little man, rubbing his hands together as if it pleased him. I am a humbug. But this is terrible, said the tin woodman. How shall I ever get my heart? Or my courage, asked the lion. Or my brains, wailed the scarecrow, wiping tears from his eyes with his coat sleeve. My dear friends, said Oz. I pray you not to speak of these little things. Think of me and the terrible trouble I'm in at being found out. Doesn't anyone else know you're a humbug? asked Dorothy. No one knows it but you four, and myself, replied Oz. I have fooled everyone so long that I thought I should never be found out. It was a great mistake my ever letting you into the throne room. Usually I will not see even my subjects, and so they believe I am something terrible. I don't understand, said Dorothy in bewilderment. How was it that you appeared to me as a great head? That was one of my tricks, answered Oz. Step this way, please, and I will tell you all about it. He led the way to a small chamber in the rear of the throne room, and they all followed him. He pointed to one corner in which lay the great head, made out of many thicknesses of paper, and with a carefully painted face. This I hung from the ceiling by a wire, said Oz. I stood behind the screen and pulled a thread to make the eyes move and the mouth open. But how about the voice, she inquired. Oh, I am a ventriloquist, said the little man, and I can throw the sound of my voice wherever I wish, so that you thought it was coming out of the head. Here are the other things I used to deceive you. He showed the scarecrow the dress and the mask he had worn when he seemed to be the lovely lady, and the tin woodman saw that his terrible beast was nothing but a lot of skins sewn together with slats to keep their sides out. As for the ball of fire, the false wizard had hung that also from the ceiling. It was really a ball of cotton, but when oil was poured upon it, the ball burned furiously. 
Really, said the Scarecrow, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for being such a humbug. I am, I certainly am, answered the little man sorrowfully. But it was the only thing I could do. Sit down, please. There are plenty of chairs, and I will tell you my story. So they sat down and listened while he told the following tale. I was born in Omaha. Why, that isn't very far from Kansas, cried Dorothy. No, but it's farther from here, he said, shaking his head at her sadly. When I grew up, I became a ventriloquist, and at that I was very well trained by a great master. I can imitate any kind of bird or beast. Here he mewed so like a kitten that Toto pricked up his ears and looked everywhere to see where she was. After a time, continued Oz, I tired of that and became a balloonist. What is that? asked Dorothy. A man who goes up in a balloon on circus day so as to draw a crowd of people together and get them to pay to see the circus, he explained. Oh, she said, I know. Well, one day I went up in a balloon and the ropes got twisted so that I couldn't come down again. It went way up above the clouds, so far that a current of air struck it, and it carried it many, many miles away. For a day and a night I traveled through the air, and on the morning of the second day I awoke and found the balloon floating of a strange and beautiful country. It came down gradually, and I was not hurt a bit, but I found myself in the middle of a strange people, who, seeing me come from the clouds, thought I was a great wizard. Of course, I let them think so, because they were afraid of me, and promised to do anything I wished them to. Just to amuse myself and keep the good people busy, I ordered them to build this city and my palace, and they did it all willingly and well. Then I thought, as the country was so green and beautiful, I would call it the Emerald City, and to make the name better fit, I put green spectacles on all the people, so that everything they saw was green. But isn't everything here green? asked Dorothy. No more than in any other city, replied Oz. But when you wear green spectacles, why, of course, everything you see looks green to you. The Emerald City was built a great many years ago, for I was a young man when the balloon brought me here, and I am a very old man now. But my people have worn green glasses on their eyes so long that most of them think it really is an Emerald City, and it certainly is a beautiful place, abounding in jewels and precious metals and every good thing that is needed to make one happy. I have been good to the people, and they like me, but ever since this palace was built, I have shut myself up and would not see any of them. One of my greatest fears was the witches, for when I had no magical powers at all, I soon found out that the witches were really able to do wonderful things. There were four of them in this country, and they ruled the people who lived in the north and south and east and west. Fortunately, the witches of the north and south were good, and I knew they would do me no harm. But the witches of the east and west were terribly wicked, and they had not thought I was more and had they not thought I was more powerful than they themselves, they would surely have destroyed me. As it was, I lived in deadly fear of them for many years, so you can imagine how pleased I was when I heard your house had fallen on the wicked witch of the east. When you came to me, I was willing to promise anything if you would only do away with the other witch. But now that you have melted her, I am ashamed to say that I cannot keep my promises. I think you are a very bad man, said Dorothy. Oh no, my dear, I'm really a very good man. But I am a very bad wizard, I must admit. Can't you give me brains? asked the scarecrow. You don't need them. You are learning something every day. A baby has brains, but it doesn't know much. Experience is the only thing that brings knowledge, and the longer you are on earth, the more experience you are sure to get. That may all be true, said the scarecrow, but I shall be very unhappy unless you give me brains. The false wizard looked at him carefully. Well, he said with a sigh, I'm not much of a magician, as I said, but if you will come to me tomorrow morning, I will stuff your head with brains. I cannot tell you how to use them, however. You must find that out for yourself. Oh, thank you, thank you, cried the scarecrow. I'll find a way to use them, never fear. But how about my courage? asked the lion anxiously. You have plenty of courage, I am sure, answered Oz. All you need is confidence in yourself. There is no living thing that is not afraid when it faces danger. True courage is in facing danger when you are afraid 
and that kind of courage you have in plenty. Perhaps I have, but I'm scared just the same, said the lion. I shall really be very unhappy unless you give me the sort of courage that makes one forget he is afraid. Very well, replied Oz. I will give you that sort of courage tomorrow. How about my heart? asked the tin woodman. Why, as for that, answered Oz, I think you are wrong to want a heart. It makes most people unhappy. If you only knew it, you are in luck not to have a heart. That must be a matter of opinion, said the tin woodman. For my part, I will bear all the unhappiness without a murmur, if you will give me the heart. Very well, answered Oz meekly. Come to me tomorrow, and you shall have your heart. I have played wizard for so many years that I may as well continue the part a little longer. And now, said Dorothy, how am I to go back to Kansas? We shall have to think about that, replied the little man. Give me two or three days to consider the matter, and I'll try to find a way to carry you over the desert. In the meantime, you shall all be treated as my guests, and while you live in the palace, my people will wait upon you and obey your slightest wish. There is only one thing I ask in return for my help, such as it is. You must keep my secret and tell no one that I am a humbug. They agreed to say nothing of what they had learned and went back to their rooms in high spirits. Even Dorothy had hope that the great, terrible humbug, as she called him, would find a way to send her back to Kansas, and if he did, she was willing to forgive him everything. The next morning, the scarecrow said to his friends, Congratulate me! I'm on my... I am going to Oz to get my brains at last. When I return, I shall be as other men are. You have always... I have always liked you as you were, said Dorothy simply. It's kind of you to like a scarecrow, he replied. But surely you will think more of me when you hear the splendid thoughts my new brain is going to turn out. Then he said goodbye to them all in a cheerful voice and went to the throne room, where he rapped upon the door. Come in, said Oz. The scarecrow went in and found the little man sitting down by the window, engaged in deep thought. I have come for my brains, said the scarecrow a little uneasily. Oh yes, sit down in that chair, please, replied Oz. You must excuse me for taking your head off, but I shall have to do it in order to put your brains in their proper place. That's all right, said the scarecrow. You're quite welcome to take my head off, as long as it will be a better one when you put it on again. So the wizard unfastened his head and emptied out the straw. Then he entered the back room and took up a measure of bran, which he mixed with a great many pins and needles. Having shaken them together thoroughly, he filled the top of the scarecrow's head with the mixture and stuffed the rest of the space with straw, straw to hold it in place. When he had fastened the scarecrow's head on his body, again he said to him, Hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of brand new brains. The scarecrow was both pleased and proud at the fulfillment of his greatest wish, and having thanked Oz warmly, he went back to his friends. Dorothy looked at him curiously, his head was quite bulging out at the top with brains. How do you feel? she asked. I feel wise indeed, he answered earnestly. When I get used to my brains, I shall know everything. Why are those pins and needles sticking out of your head? asked the tin woodman. That is proof that he is sharp, remarked the lion. Well, I must go to Oz and get my heart, said the woodman. So he walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, called Oz, and the woodman entered and said, I have come for my heart. Very well, answered the little man, but I shall have to cut a hole in your breast so I can put your heart in the right place. I hope it won't hurt you. Oh no, answered the woodman, I shall not feel it at all. So Oz brought a pair of tinner's shears and cut a small square hole in the left side of the tin woodman's breast. Then, going to a chest of drawers, he took out a pretty heart made entirely of silk and stuffed with sawdust. Isn't it a beauty? he asked. It is indeed, replied the woodman, who was greatly pleased. But is it a kind heart? Oh, very, answered Oz. He put the heart in the woodman's breast, and then he replaced the square of tin, soldering it ne neatly together where it had been cut. There, he said, now you have a heart that any man might be proud of. I'm sorry I had to put a patch on your breast, but it really couldn't be helped. Never mind the patch, exclaimed the happy woodman. I am very grateful to you, and shall never forget your kindness. 
Don't speak of it, replied Oz. Then the Tidman Woodman went back to his friends, who wished him every joy on account of his good fortune. The lion now walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, said Oz. I have come for my courage, announced the lion, entering the room. Very well, answered the little man. I will get it for you. He went up to a cupboard and, reaching up to a high shelf, took down a square green bottle, the contents of which he poured into a green gold dish, beautifully carved. Placing this before the cowardly lion, who sniffed at it as if he did not like it, the wizard said, Drink. What is it? asked the lion. Well, answered Oz, if it were inside you, it would be courage. You know, of course, that courage is always inside one, so that this really cannot be called courage until you have swallowed it. Therefore, I advise you to drink it as soon as possible. The lion hesitated no longer, but drank till the dish was empty. How do you feel now? asked Oz. Full of courage, replied the lion, who went joyfully back to his friends to tell them of his good fortune. Oz left to himself, smiled to think of his, think of his success in giving the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion exactly what they thought they wanted. How can I help being a humbug, he said, when all these people make me do things that everybody knows can't be done. It was easy to make the scarecrow and the lion and the woodman happy, because they imagined I could do anything. But it will take more than imagination to carry Dorothy back to Kansas. And I'm sure I don't know how it can be done. And that is the end of our reading for today. So tune in on Friday and find out if the wizard can come up with an idea to get Dorothy back to Kansas and what happens tomorrow. Hope you have a good day, and I will see you tomorrow to see what happens in the story.